Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, and at his home in Vancouver is my good friend Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. Yo, yo, yo. Yo, wh- how are things? This is episode 300 of the show. Episode 300. Na, 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 na. Right? Do, 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 do. Wow. <laughs> We're almost to 301. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us, people. Yeah, right? Or joining us today. It, maybe today is the first show that you're listening to us, and it's episode 300. And boy, does this show have a lot of history. Anyway. Can I do a little bit of a shout out? Yes, sure. So I want to shout out to Nick at Sweet Tea Bakery who fangirled on me. Yeah, so she fangirled on me. Oh, nice. She's a very cool woman and I was at a bakery over the holidays. Well, there you go. I think I was at a lot of bakeries over the holidays and my scale shows it. (laughs) You know the trick? My trick is I'm not going to step on the scale until uh, three months from now. Oh, when you're feeling better. Yeah. (sighs) Yeah, there you go. Anyway, Happy New Year from the Dark Poutine family to yours. Let's get this show on the road. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some Dark Poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to Dark Poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In June 2011, 20-year-old musician Daniel Jordan Levesque moved from his family home in Revelstoke, B.C. to Victoria, full of dreams to start a new life and advance his burgeoning musical career. On June 15th, seeking work, Daniel went to a 7-Eleven store where he met Joshua Tyler Brito, the store's assistant manager, who hired Daniel on the spot. Brito presented himself as a good guy, a helpful friend, but in truth became quickly obsessed with Daniel sexually and had nefarious motives in mind. Brito began grooming Daniel, lying to him with promises of a more lavish lifestyle, plying him with drugs and alcohol while telling Daniel he saw him as a little brother. The coercion and lies continued until August 3rd when Brito lured Daniel to his apartment under the promise of an interview for Daniel at a non-existent law firm. It was there that Brito killed Daniel and set up a scene to make it appear to be self-defense, then called 911. Brito was arrested that night and charged with Daniel's murder. However, the case was not put to rest until after a mistrial in 2015 and a guilty plea to the lesser charge of manslaughter in 2017. As this is the 300th episode of the show, we wanted to do something special. So both parts of this two-part episode will be released on the same day, with the first part telling the story of Daniel Levesque's life and subsequent senseless and brutal end. In part two, we'll hear from Daniel's mother, Stacy Thur. Stacy has provided insight into Daniel's life like only a mother can. 
She'll give us details about Daniel's life and the aftermath of his killing, including updates about Daniel's killer and his alleged post-incarceration activities. Stacy also graciously provided me with a large cache of information on the case, as well as personal items belonging to Daniel, including things like his wallet, jewelry, and the shoes he wore to his final meeting with his killer. The box is filled with photos of Daniel, news clippings about his death, and many heartfelt tributes written by scores of people who loved him. Never have I felt this close to a victim of such a brutal crime as that perpetrated against Daniel Levesque, and there were tears as I wrote. I'm hoping this episode expresses even a little bit how much Daniel Jordan Levesque was adored and how much the world has missed out on what he didn't get to contribute, thanks to the selfish actions of one man, the man who took his life. This is the story of a family's devastating loss. This is Dark Poutine Episode 300, The Murder of Daniel Levesque, Lured by Lies, Part 1. In high school, Daniel's mom, Stacy, met Daniel's father, Stephen Levesque, and they became sweethearts. A few years after high school, Stacy became pregnant, and Daniel Jordan Levesque was born in Kamloops, B.C. on May 25, 1991. Stacy and Stephen were married soon after. Stacy was 21. Daniel's first little brother, Christian, was born a year and a half later, but as with many married so young, the marriage between Stephen and Stacy broke up when Daniel was just three. Tragedy struck six months later when Christian, only 23 months old, passed away one night in his crib. When Daniel was four years old, there was some light in Stacy's life. She met and married Derek Thur. The couple added to their family with another son, Joel, and a daughter, Lainey. Daniel adored and doted on both his half-siblings, the ever-present big brother. Nine years after they were married, Stacy and Derek also broke up. Daniel loved Derek, however, calling both Stephen and him dad. When Joel and Lainey visited their father after the separation, Daniel went along too. That's the type of family this is, and the type of guy that Daniel was. Daniel was a vivacious, outgoing, loving youngster with scores of friends. According to Stacy, many of Daniel's friends considered him their best friend, and the feeling for Daniel was mutual. Stacy recalled him saying I love you as freely with his male and female friends as he did with her and the rest of the family. He was a happy-go-lucky boy who loved to give and get hugs. He was an active kid, loved the outdoors, and played hockey in the winter and baseball during the summertime. He was always on the go and surrounded by friends. Daniel always said, I love you to Stacy as he ran out the door as a youngster and then later in phone calls and text messages. He was creative and expressive, so it isn't surprising that he was attracted to the arts, particularly music and poetry. He played saxophone in the school band, but most of all, he loved playing the guitar and singing. Music was a central part of Daniel's life, and he possessed considerable talent for playing various musical instruments. He taught himself to play the guitar at a young age and had a strong passion for singing and composing music. His lifelong dream was to become a successful musician and maybe even a rock star, and he was determined to pursue this goal, even though he acknowledged the need to work at other jobs to support himself along the way. In 2023, on the anniversary of Daniel's death, Stacy shared some memories of Daniel on Facebook. Quote, Daniel was a bright and beautiful child. He was eager to learn and please. He was chatty and bold and quite the handful. Raising him was oftentimes an adventure. I was young and not exactly a pro, lol. He was also sensitive and loving. He carried that sensitive heart into his teenage years. Daniel and I didn't always agree on things. We did fight, but we loved as much as we fought. I was only doing the best I knew how, and so was he. I tried to curb his social life much to his distress, and as involved as I was, and I was, he was sometimes up to things I didn't know about. I talked to all my kids about the experimentation phase that teens go through. We had all the talks, but he still hid a lot from me. I know that's typical for a teen. But as much as he hid things from me, he shared more things. We were as close as a mother and son could be, end quote. Yeah, that sounds like, um, frankly, typical mom-teenage-son yeah. relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, my mom had my brother and I, um, when she's around 20, she had the two of us. 
mm-hmm. like very young age. And so I can relate to Stacy's perspective on on being a young parent. I, I think that for many of us by our 20s, we uh, later 20s especially, we start to realize our parents were just humans and, and doing the best they could. Right. Despite their youth, you know? You know, I actually had a heartfelt conversation with my mom about like her age and her sacrifices and and all she she did for my brother and I mm-hmm. and you know Stacy to me sounds like an amazing mom and and it saddens me that Daniel I don't know if he did or didn't but perhaps didn't get a chance to get a little bit older and have that similar talk with her you know yeah. Be- because yeah. his because his life was taken mm-hmm. exactly in another Facebook post only weeks after Daniel's death Stacy wrote quote. For those of you who knew Daniel and all he was and did, we all know he was a good man with morals and a soul full of love. He rarely had a bad thing to say about anyone. He looked for the good in everyone and often defended the weak. He wasn't perfect, no one is, but he tried. End quote. For his last two summers, Daniel spent time with his father, Stephen, and stepmom, Lisa Chanel Levesque, where he was paid to work helping them around the golf course they managed. According to Lisa, Daniel rode the golf course's mower and loved bombing around riding the four-wheel gator with other youngsters on the ground crew. His dad and stepmom were happy for the help and impressed with Daniel's enthusiasm. In previous summers, he'd not as readily participated, loathing the 5 a.m. wake-up time for the start of the day's chores. Lisa recalled her early days with Daniel in her relationship with Steve even before Christian passed away. Quote, yes, Lisa wrote, Daniel and I had our moments. We butted heads on more than a few occasions. But that was Daniel and his strong personality, like me. I never told Daniel what to do, just what I thought of certain things he didn't want to tell his mom or dad. And in a way, I treasured the fact that he would only talk to me about these things. Yes, we had talks, but I knew he was smart enough to make the right choices. We became quite close for the last five years. The day his dad and I finally, chuckle, got married was the day he said to me, Hey, Lisa, I can finally call you mom. I smiled and said, Yes, my son, you can. But in my mind, he was a son way before that day. I have a lot of fond memories of Daniel, Lisa continued, teaching him to ski, teaching him to fish with his dad, Stephen, camping trips where Daniel and I would always catch the most fish, Introducing him to 80s music, he loved it. Last summer was a great summer with him, probably one of our best. Taking him out to the bar with the Cougars, poor kid didn't have a chance. Lisa wrote about a summer shopping trip to Edmonton, where she and Daniel wore Steve out with their frenzied shopping. She wrote, quote, But Steve did introduce him to winners, where he would spend his whole check on t-shirts and hoodies. End quote. You know how much I love winners, Mike. <laughs> you do? <laughs> I have two winter coats, Carl Lagerfeld collection that were only $120 each. My husband says it makes me look like a pimp, but I love them. Uh, to to the US listeners, Winners is actually the st- same company as TJ Maxx, and in the UK it's TK Maxx. But you can get you can get such good deals. I'm totally with Steve on uh, uh, on that. So I went to Winners the other day. It's interesting that we're talking about this, and I bought a couple of pairs of sweatpants yeah because i love to wear sweatpants around the house and in one of the sweatpants zipped up was a bloody kleenex and right a bloody kleenex and a broken a security tag so it's like somebody had stolen these pants (laughs) before and winners had resold them (laughs) okay well that's not okay it went they went right into the wash obviously but that That doesn't always happen. No. (laughs) But I digress. Stepmom Lisa also noticed his gratitude and politeness. Quote, One thing I could always guarantee from Daniel is he always thanked me for dinner and told me how amazing it was, end quote. Lisa regrets never having the chance to teach Daniel to cook. She remembers Daniel as loving, thoughtful, and kind. She wrote, quote, The last thing Daniel said to me or wrote on Facebook was, I love you. It has burned into my heart forever. He knew the difficult time I was having with my mother being diagnosed with cancer and has made a full recovery. I think Daniel helped with that. He took the time out of his day to tell me that because that was how Daniel rolled, as he would say to me out on the golf course, end quote. 
Daniel had grown into a good-looking young man with an inviting smile and a sparkle in his eye, indicating a lot was happening inside. Many of the photos shared with me show a young man filled with love and a zest for living, and the people around him loved him too. He also developed a playful, artistic musician's style of dress, sometimes sporting shaggy hair and multiple piercings, one through his lip and another through his tongue. According to his mom, Daniel was girl crazy from a young age. Stacy said he always knew which girl he liked. She recalled comforting her distraught son several times after high school rejections or breakups. Daniel had, however, fallen in love with a Norwegian girl named Therese, who'd come to Revelstoke with a friend to live in Canada for a year. He was smitten. After Therese returned to Norway in August 2010, the pair stayed in close contact. Daniel joined her in Norway, and they lived together from December 2010 to March 2011. After Daniel returned to Canada, the couple began talking about Therese making a permanent move to Canada so they could be together. They were in contact all the time via the internet. Daniel had a spiritual side, too. Stacy raised her kids in the Alliance Church in Revelstoke. According to the history page on their website, the Revelstoke Alliance Church is part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance Evangelical Denomination, which grew out of the vision of A.B. Simpson in the late 1800s. A.B. Simpson was born in Canada in 1843. In 1881, started the Gospel Tabernacle Church in New York City, where all the poor, homeless, sick, displaced, and neglected people would be welcome. Not long after, the Christian and Missionary Alliance was born, an alliance of people from all different denominational backgrounds with the same vision of reaching out locally and globally, accepting all people no matter their station in life with the transforming message of Christ. The history of the Revelstoke Alliance Church began in 1941 with a small group of people gathering for Sunday school meetings. This group grew to the point where they were able to hire a permanent pastor in 1943 and buy a lot in 1945 for the building of their first church, the Alliance Chapel. In 1976, there was a fire at the church, and so the decision was made to rebuild on their present location. They desire to create a safe place where the color of your skin, your bank account, your job, sex, age, or background has no bearing on your acceptance. It has been their privilege to serve this community for over 70 years. End quote. So along with Stacy's children and many others, Daniel went to Sunday school as a child. But Stacy would later testify that Daniel continued his spiritual relationship with God into adulthood. Stacy said that Daniel often spoke of spiritual things. She recalled helping him to prepare to move to Victoria in the summer of 2011. Stacy said, quote, When I got his suitcases, in his suitcases he had little pieces of paper that were handwritten, handwritten Bible verses on them inside his suitcase. And he really, he really did love God. He always wanted to be a better person. He prayed a lot, end quote. Daniel Levesque moved to Victoria in early June 2011 for several reasons. He had long wanted to leave his small hometown of Revelstoke and pursue a music career, aiming for the opportunities a larger city could offer. Victoria was chosen as his destination due to the encouragement of a friend, Michelle, who resided there. He hoped to make a solid home for him and Therese so she would be more secure for moving to Canada. Additionally, Daniel had a job prospect lined up as a cook at a brew pub called Moon Over the Water in Victoria. However, this job fell through as they hired someone else before he could start. You know, the one thing in my mind right here is um, the movie Sliding Doors. That, And the concept of the movie is, uh, if I can remember it correctly, is somebody misses a train. Mm. Um, and they show, like, if they'd got the train, what their lives would become versus if when they missed the train, right? Because it sets off different events and... It, yeah, you know, when you're reading that, I was like, oh my God, imagine if he'd got that job, he'd be alive right now. Just one small thing, one small thing uh, could have changed that trajectory. And it's just so sad to think, you know, you, you end up in the wrong place in front of the wrong people and how how that can affect your life through yep. no fault, through absolutely no fault of your own. No fault. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel mentioned his concerns about his lack of success in his job hunt and frequent texts to his mom. They stayed in close touch during this period after Daniel's big move. Stacy suggested that he could return home if necessary, however, Daniel would have none of that. 
He was determined to make it work in Victoria and hoped to find a suitable employment soon. Daniel temporarily stayed in a house on Maplewood and Saanich. This arrangement was facilitated by subletting a bedroom from friends attending a school in Victoria. Daniel knew that this living arrangement was short-term and that he would need to find alternative housing by the end of the summer. As Daniel's job search continued, he became increasingly concerned about his financial situation. He borrowed money from his father to cover expenses and was diligently looking for a job, willing to accept any available work after two weeks of searching. While he may have experienced some stress and concern, his determination to stay there and pursue his musical aspirations remained unwavering. Daniel finally got a job at a 7-Eleven store on Douglas Street in Victoria where he would earn $12 an hour with medical and dental benefits. He informed his mom about this job and Stacy breathed a measured sigh of relief. On June 15, 2011, Daniel had spontaneously applied for the position after seeing a now hiring sign at the store. He inquired about the job and was hired on the spot by the assistant store manager, Joshua Tyler Brito. Brito was impressed by Daniel's appearance and conducted a brief interview over the counter. Brito commented that Daniel looked famous and later said he looked a lot like the now infamous lead singer of Headley, Jacob Hoggard, who was later convicted of sexual assault. I don't see the resemblance. Daniel started his job at 7-Eleven the following day. He was just beginning his new life and had less than two months to live. More after a quick break. And we are back. Matthew, what are your thoughts so far? You know, I'm looking at Daniel, young, handsome musician, when his mom talked about him being a bit of a handful, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of myself in a way. I can Mm -hmm. really, and you just, I don't know, you can, you can tell that you'd like this guy when you met him. You know what I mean? You can just tell, you can tell he's a good person. Like, you know, obviously, I never met him, but I can tell. And and so my first thought is, it's just that it, it's so sad. It's so sad, right? And the other thing is, you know, as because I I've read the script and I know what we're going to be talking about, and this happens to me often because we know what happens. So as we're going through this, it feels like it's slow motion and you want to yell don't believe him or don't go there Mm -hmm. Um, but in real life it would have been so sudden and unexpected for his mom and his family and his friends just suddenly he's gone and having to figure out what happened and unpick this truth because Mm -hmm. the 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 truth is unpicked already right we're doing we're doing the unpicked truth right in the episode but his mom had to go through all of that to figure it out yeah Right, which is just horrible. I've mentioned it earlier that uh, because of the material that Stacy shared with me, I f- feel closer to Daniel's story than I've ever felt uh, to any story before. You texted me halfway through you, you're writing this, letting me know you're having a hard time because y- yeah. you feel so connected because he spoke to his mom. Yeah, well, it's it's not just this, the conversation with her it's she shared a box full of memories yeah with me Uh, i have here behind me a book of condolences from the funeral i have scores of letters from people who loved daniel and wanted to support stacy after what happened on and on and on i have evidence that the police collected that day so i have i have been able to handle things you know, like, for example, Daniel's shoes. I could handle Daniel's shoes that he was wearing on the day that he died. It's just, I, I'm i so angry that this scumbag did this to him. Yeah. I'm, actu- I'm actually so angry. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes when we do stories, usually when they're old stories, like, you know, the 1800s, yeah. there's, you can have a distance from it because mm-hmm. it's, it's history. But when I read this, I was just so upset. Uh, for for Daniel and for his family and for his friends. Um, If anyone didn't deserve it, it's this guy, man. 
In June 2011, Joshua Tyler Brito, the assistant manager who had hired Daniel, lived with his then-girlfriend in a Cormorant Street apartment in Victoria. Although plans were previously in motion for them to marry, they had relationship problems and were in the midst of breaking up. Josh was not being honest with his girlfriend. According to an agreed statement of facts, Brito had led his girlfriend to believe he was heterosexual, but that was not true. He was attracted to Daniel immediately upon meeting him, but outwardly maintained he was merely a good friend with Daniel's best interests at heart. He began the process of love-bombing Daniel to win him over. Love-bombing is a term often used in the context of relationships, particularly in the realm of dating and romance. It refers to a manipulative and controlling tactic one person employs to gain power and control over another individual. The basic idea behind love bombing is to overwhelm someone with affection, attention, compliments, and expressions of love and affection to create a strong emotional bond and dependence. Individuals who engage in love bombing often do so to manipulate or emotionally control their target. This tactic can make the recipient feel special, desired, and deeply connected to the person engaging in love bombing. However, it is typically not a genuine expression of love or care, but rather a way to gain influence or advantage. Once the targeted individual becomes emotionally invested and reliant on the person love bombing them, the manipulator may begin to exert control, becoming demanding, or engage in other manipulative behaviors. This can lead to a toxic and unhealthy dynamic in the relationship. Love bombing is considered a red flag in relationships and is often associated with narcissistic or manipulative individuals. It's essential to be aware of such tactics and maintain healthy boundaries in relationships to avoid falling into manipulative traps. Take it from someone who knows, love bombing does not have to involve a sexual relationship. It can happen in platonic relationships as well. I personally have been taken in more than once in just this way. Within days of meeting Josh Brito, Stacy later told police that Daniel was saying, quote, Oh, Mom, my boss, he's so great. He's the nicest guy in the world. He's young, he's 26, and he really likes me. He thinks I'm funny and smart, and we just become such good friends. So not only is he my boss, he's my friend, end quote. According to court documents, Brito also claimed the pair bonded over drugs and alcohol, with Brito always picking up the tab. Again, from court documents, quote, Over the next seven weeks, Brito told various lies to Daniel about his life, family, sexuality, and intentions toward him in order to garner Daniel's attention, sympathy, and trust. Brito also said and did things to lead Daniel to believe that he was heterosexual, including telling Daniel that he considered him to be like family and like a little brother. Daniel believed Brito's lies and came to trust him absolutely. Daniel Levesque came to see Josh Brito as one of his best friends. End quote. As with many coercive relationships, things happen very quickly. The lies came fast and hard and made Daniel's head spin. Josh was telling Daniel he liked his work ethic and that he had management potential. Brito led Daniel to believe that an assistant manager at 7-Eleven could make good money. Brito said he earned $60,000 a year working at 7-Eleven and made another $60,000 a year working on a mayoral campaign. In reality, Brito earned considerably less at 7-Eleven and received only a small stipend for his work on the mayoral campaign. Josh gave Daniel gifts and arranged opportunities for him to keep him close and spend time with Daniel. Brito regularly paid for dinners and drinks and assisted Daniel with money for food, cigarettes, and transportation. Only a few weeks after starting at 7-Eleven, Josh Brito told Daniel he was getting a significant raise. According to Stacy, Daniel said that Josh approached him and told him that there had been an elderly couple who had come into 7-Eleven one day when Daniel was working, and that Daniel was so kind and caring and helpful to them that they had called 7-Eleven head office and told them how wonderful this young man was and that his name was Daniel. Josh told Daniel that 7-Eleven head office had called him 
and had been so impressed with how happy these customers were with Daniel's service that Daniel should be given an immediate raise to $18 an hour. Although the promised raise was made early in Daniel's employment, Brito always had seemingly plausible excuses for the raise never materializing. Stacy later said that, as she and Daniel shared a bank account, his final check from 7-Eleven did not reflect that raise. Brito presented himself as a privileged person whose family paid for his lifestyle. He said he had no bills, not even rent. He said his family owned a successful law firm in Calgary and another in Victoria. Brito quickly claimed he saw Daniel as family and wanted to help him succeed in life to pay it forward. This guy is just one horrible human being. Right. I mean, on the face of it, you're thinking, oh, what a nice guy. But, <laughs> you know, he had nothing but selfish motives in mind. Nothing but. Daniel and his girlfriend Therese broke up. He was devastated. Around the same time, Josh Brito and his girlfriend also broke up. Daniel and Josh bonded over the broken relationships. Daniel was sad, but Brito saw it as an opportunity to draw closer to Daniel for whom his sexual attraction was growing. Daniel's interests were elsewhere. He quickly met lots of young women during his time in Victoria. He texted Stacy about how impressed he was with the number of pretty girls in Victoria. Many came into 7-Eleven, where Daniel would chat them up. After mustering the courage and to mend his broken heart, he even dated a couple of them. He told his mother that one young woman, an Italian named Francesca, was teaching him Italian and was even talking about going to Italy. Daniel was trying hard to move on. At some point, Josh told Daniel he'd been telling his family stories about this talented young man working for him at 7-Eleven. Brito said his family wanted to meet Daniel and even set dates for this to happen, but these meetings always seemed to fall through for one dramatic reason or another. According to court documents, Brito also lied about fictitious events in his family, suggesting he was struggling with various family crises, including cancer, death, infidelity, and lawsuits against his family. All of this was designed to gain Daniel's sympathy for the difficulties Josh said he was facing and to draw Daniel closer. He was carefully grooming his target. We hear the term grooming used a lot in anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric, but it is genuinely a thing. And now, Matthew, you have some opinions on the word grooming and you, you're uncomfortable with it for some reasons that, you know, I'd like you to get into. When I was reading the script, you actually said at the very beginning, and I, I actually highlighted it in red, not knowing that you're going to get into what it means. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, I really don't like the word because of its association with anti-gay rhetoric. Yep. And often linking gays to pedophilia, mm -hmm. right? And especially male same sex, right? Right. And... You know, when you look at narratives in the news involving heterosexual interactions, you see terms like controlling or gaslighting or manipulating or overbearing or, or even love bombing, which you, you use in this episode. Mm -hmm. But grooming is rarely used. And in, in fact, I don't think I've personally come across it um, in any articles about male-female adult interactions. Well, you're going to hear it on this podcast because I know an individual who used to be very close to me who spent a lot of time grooming women, adult women, for his own nefarious purposes. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. But my, 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 my point is, um, it's a word I don't like. I've actually seen the word grooming used by bigots about a gay man who's me too. Simpl who simply showed interest in asking out another man. It's like yeah. that ain't grooming. It's no. fucking asking somebody out, right? Yeah. It's it's like when I when I went to Pride that time and I had a beard. Uh, this guy, <laughs> this guy uh, hit on me. He said, "Oh, what a cute little cubby you are." Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know, my wife's over there, so you're you're barking up the wrong tree, but thank you very much. I didn't see that as, like, somebody trying to groom me. It was just somebody telling me I was good looking. Exactly. It was somebody coming on to you, right? Yeah. Is, yeah there's nothing wrong with that. Which adults do. So it, yeah. it, so it bothers me that it seems to be exclusively applied to male-male interactions mm -hmm. yeah. or situations involving pedophiles. Well, let's change that. 
So while grooming is a real concern, it, it's perplexing to me why it's selectively applied to these specific contexts. And don't get me wrong, right? This scumbag was doing it to Daniel. I just yeah. want us to I just want to us to be aware of the problem of the language because when you use it at the very top of this episode, I was immediately uncomfortable. I used it there to be a bit incendiary. And because I knew it would facilitate this conversation. <laughs> Mike okay, just for everyone out there, Mike put shit in here in in episodes that he knows is gonna rile me up intentionally <laughs> to yeah. give to give the episode a bit of spark. <laughs> he knows well, he knows which buttons to push. <laughs> well, because I want I want I want us to interact because I want to, I want us to have good conversation. I'm like, damn you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I love you, Matthew. <laughs> uh, grooming of adult victims refers to a manipulative process in which an individual or group systematically builds trust, emotional connection, and dependency with an adult target to exploit, control, or abuse them in various ways. Grooming can occur in various contexts such as romantic relationships, professional settings, friendships, or even within religious or social groups. While grooming is often associated with child exploitation, it is also a common tactic used to control adults. Here are the key steps and tactics involved in grooming adult victims. Identifying Vulnerabilities the groomer first identifies the vulnerabilities or weaknesses of the target. These vulnerabilities could be emotional, psychological, financial, or related to personal circumstances. Groomers look for areas where the victim may be susceptible or need support or validation. Daniel Levesque, for example, was a young man just getting started in life. He needed work to support himself, and he was new to the community, building trust and rapport. Groomers work on establishing trust and rapport with the victim. They may do this by being empathetic, attentive, and appearing supportive. Groomers often present themselves as caring, understanding, and dependable individuals. Isolating the victim. Groomers may isolate the victim from their friends and family, creating a sense of dependence on the groomer. They do this to control the victim's access to outside perspectives and support systems, making it easier to manipulate them. Emotional manipulation. Groomers use emotional manipulation tactics to reinforce the emotional connection with the victim. They may employ flattery, compliments, and positive reinforcement to make the victim feel valued and special. This can create a strong emotional bond. Gradual escalation. Over time, the groomer gradually introduces more control, boundaries, or demands into the relationship. This escalation can include controlling the victim's actions, decisions, finances, or personal life. Testing boundaries. Groomers push boundaries to see how compliant the victim is. They may introduce subtle or gradual changes in the relationship dynamic, often masking them as expressions of love or care. Maintaining secrecy. Groomers often emphasize the importance of secrecy, encouraging the victim not to share details of the relationship with others. This secrecy makes it harder for the victim to seek help or support from friends and family. Exploitation. Ultimately, groomers exploit their victims for various purposes, which can include financial gain, sexual exploitation, emotional control, or other forms of abuse. The victim may feel trapped or unable to escape the situation due to their emotional attachment to the groomer. It's essential for individuals to be aware of the signs of grooming and to maintain healthy boundaries in relationships. If you suspect that you or someone you know is being groomed or manipulated, seeking help from a trusted friend, family member, therapist, or counselor is crucial. Grooming is a serious issue that can have long-lasting emotional and psychological consequences and addressing it early is essential to protect the victim's well-being. Getting help is the best thing you can do, and as someone who's been through it, I can assure you that's true. Josh Brito employed these tactics masterfully in his dealing with Daniel. Josh said he'd been planning a trip to Cuba with his former girlfriend and offered her ticket to Daniel so they could hang out, party, and go out looking for girls together. Daniel was excited by the prospect. 
he had no idea that there was no real trip to Cuba planned at all. In the last few weeks of July, Brito told Daniel he could get him a job as a clerical secretary at the branch of his family's law firm. Daniel, over the moon, texted Stacy with the good news. On July 20th, he wrote, quote, Got the job as a legal secretary, lol. Gonna work alongside the best lawyers in the city. 22 an hour, starting September 1st, end quote. Stacy wrote back, excited for her son, unaware he'd applied for the job. Stacy mentioned that she thought Daniel should buy some dress clothes and asked whether they were training him. Daniel wrote back, quote, It's my current boss's parents' law firm, eh? He's had it with the store and likes me so much he got me the job. I'm so freaking excited. Subsequent planned meetings to Josh's family, including a trip to Calgary and orientations at the law firm, were canceled due to made-up reasons. The truth was that Josh's family didn't own a law firm. None of them were lawyers. Also, Josh's performance at work had diminished so much that his employment with 7-Eleven was about to be terminated. There were allegations about deposits going missing. Josh's stories to Daniel were all a massive pack of lies meant to lure Daniel in further. On July 28, 2011, only days before he killed Daniel, Josh Brito arranged and paid for Daniel to have a recording and production session at a Victoria Music Studio. The initial recording was Daniel alone, singing and playing his guitar to a song by Leonard Skinner, Simple Man. Stacy Thur has kept that raw audio to herself, as she doesn't wish to share it with Josh Brito. So after Daniel's death, Daniel's friends remixed the song with new instruments to accompany him. Among them were Jackson Yauk, Daniel's Victoria roommate playing drums, and Jamie Fitchett on guitar. It's rare that we get to hear a victim's voice, especially one so passionate, only days before he died. Here's the song.
if you try All that I want for you, my son Is to be satisfied Stacey Thur went to see Daniel in Vancouver on July 31, 2011. Josh was unavailable to meet, and this was the last time Stacy saw her son alive. At 1.39 on August 3, 2011, Daniel Levesque texted his mom, quote, orientation at the firm today and tomorrow, happy face emoji, love you. And Stacy wrote back, good luck, XOXO. Daniel was excited about other things as well. He and his roommate Jackson were about to sign a lease on a downtown condo that evening, and it was only a five-minute walk to where he believed he would be working. Stacy wrote, quote, That's unreal. I hope you can afford it. And Daniel texted back, quote, It's surprisingly affordable, furnished, and hydro included. Also save money, not needing a bus pass. Stacy messaged, That's awesome. At 2.32 p.m., Daniel wrote back, in all caps, YUP, with a smiley face emoji, and that's the last text he sent. This guy was ruining Daniel's life and his finances and his housing. So Daniel was planning a life and making decisions based on the lies that this guy was telling him. Mm -hmm. And just showing these these texts are hard to, like, you, you see that? You know, this text, that's like, like, that's like a text back and forth I'd easily have with my mom, right? Sure, yeah. So so on top of that, the guys, even before he kills Daniel, he's, he's ruining his life. And also, like, f- like pulling the wool over his family and his mom, right? Well, like, well this is the pattern with this guy that we will talk about when... Uh... Stacy and I chat in the bonus episode because since his release, he's allegedly been up to similar types of manipulation, not this exact same thing, but similar types. As only Joshua Brito survived what occurred next, the facts of the rest of the story had to be pieced together by the forensic evidence collected by investigators 
and subsequent interviews with Brito, who was known for his lies. The description of events comes from court documents. On August 3rd, 2011, Josh Brito had had little sleep in the previous three days and had been using cocaine regularly. He also knew all of his lies, including those about the job opportunity with a fictitious law firm and the phony trip to Cuba, would soon be discovered by Daniel. When Daniel arrived at Josh's apartment that afternoon, he expected that he and Josh would be going to his orientation at the law firm. However, Josh fabricated another lie and told Daniel that the orientation had been cancelled. They then started using cocaine, which Brito had purchased earlier that day. At some point, Daniel began to question Josh about the orientation session and why it had been cancelled. He questioned him about their upcoming trip to Cuba and Josh's various other stories that didn't quite ring true. Daniel realized that Brito had been lying to him and manipulating him. According to Josh, the two men began arguing, with Daniel becoming upset at what he was hearing from Josh. Josh claimed Daniel said their friendship was over and attempted to leave the apartment. Josh Brito, much larger and heavier than Daniel, tried to physically prevent him from leaving. Josh said that Daniel became frightened and tried to escape his grasp. Losing control and having his lies unraveling, Josh claimed he grabbed a hammer that he had in the apartment at that point. Using the hammer, he struck Daniel on the head three times, once while Daniel was attempting to cover his head with his hands. During this altercation, the hammer broke into two pieces. At this point, Daniel's scalp was bleeding profusely, and he was quickly losing a lot of blood. Fearing for his life, Daniel fought to leave the apartment. He made it to the front door, but Brito caught him there, where Daniel put up a mighty fight. But again, Brito overpowered Daniel and prevented him from leaving. During the struggle, Daniel's bleeding head and body forcefully came into contact with the walls around the doorway, leaving blood smears and stains. The struggle also caused several loud bangs and vibrations along the wall between the apartment and neighboring apartment. While at the doorway, Daniel desperately tried to open the door, leaving blood stains around the deadbolt. He managed to move the door handle two or three times and succeeded in partially opening the door. And while Daniel was trying to open the door, he cried out, Let me go, just let me go, and help me, help me. Brito prevented Daniel from completely opening the door, then pulled Daniel back into the apartment and closed the door again. Daniel's head was still bleeding profusely, leading Daniel to lose consciousness and fall to the living room floor. His head, saturated with blood, crashed down onto the floor, and this created another blood stain that contained several blood clots. In a panic, Josh obtained a large knife from the kitchen. He then used that knife to self-inflict injuries on his arm, stomach, and head. He then picked up Daniel, who was lying unconscious on the living room floor, and placed him face down on the couch, where the unconscious Daniel was unable to breathe properly and was bleeding to death. He then placed the kitchen knife on the floor close to Daniel's right hand to make it appear as though he had been in a mutual fight, and it was not an attack. Brito then decided he would lay down on the living room floor around two feet away from the broken hammerhead. He called 911 and gave the operator false versions of events, saying Daniel had stabbed him. Within minutes of that 911 call, police officers and emergency health services paramedics arrived at the Cormorant Street apartment. The door to the apartment was unlocked, and when the officers and paramedics entered, they noticed blood smears and stains on all five walls and the floor in the entranceway. Moving further into the apartment, they found Josh Brito conscious and lying on the floor beside a couch. Brito spoke with the officers and lied about what had happened. In doing so, he exaggerated how serious his injuries were. Stacy told me that the police discovered blood stains on the blinds to the window of the apartment as though Josh had been peering out, waiting for first responders to know when to better position himself on the floor. The police and paramedics also discovered Daniel lying face down among pillows and blankets on a second couch in the living room. He was unconscious and had no pulse. The paramedics performed CPR and they were able to resuscitate Daniel, however he remained unconscious. Josh and Daniel were taken to the Victoria General Hospital. 
Daniel was still unconscious when he arrived at the hospital and never regained consciousness. His condition worsened over the next two hours. He eventually went into cardiac arrest again. Resuscitative efforts were now unsuccessful, and at 7.44 p.m. on the 3rd of August, 2011, 20-year-old Daniel Jordan Levesque was pronounced dead. The police initially believed Josh Brito's lies and accepted that it was Daniel Levesque who'd been the aggressor. Consequently, the police treated Brito as the victim. It was not until after he had been taken to the hospital and the police could take further investigatory steps that Josh Brito became a suspect. Upon his discharge from the hospital at around 8.30 p.m. on the 3rd of August, 2011, Josh Brito was arrested for the murder of Daniel Levesque. He was subsequently charged with second-degree murder the following day. Between August 3, 2011 and December 9, 2011, Josh Brito remained in custody on that second-degree murder charge. On December 9, 2011, the Crown directed a stay of proceedings, and Josh was released from custody. They didn't think they had enough to prosecute him at the time. Josh Brito was rearrested on December 21, 2012, and charged with the first-degree murder of Daniel Levesque. He was held in custody pending his trial. Daniel had become the second homicide victim in Victoria that year. To his friends and family, he was much more than that statistic. There was an outpouring of love for Daniel and his family from everyone who knew him and many who didn't. The Victoria News said, quote, At the time, Daniel Levesque's death rocked Revelstoke. Hundreds came out to a tearful candlelight memorial in Grizzly Plaza two days later. A celebration of life was held at the community center and friends put on a sold-out concert in his memory. Also, according to the Victoria News, Steve Levesque, Daniel's father, later said, quote, Daniel was a very trusting and loving kid. He got along with everybody. He didn't judge anyone. He was honest, down-to-earth, and a loving man. End quote. No one had a bad word to say about Daniel. The poem, Soul Fire, written by Daniel Levesque and published in July of 2011, less than a week before he died, says a lot about the young man. It goes, Soul fire burn until your flames are put out. Climb higher, please and never ever doubt your existence. Because you keep us alive, your embers keep us warm, and your love defines divine. It's all for you, soul fire. You're all I trust in this life. I crave you like cigarettes, and I need you like right now and in this time, without hesitation or delay, to be with me, soul fire. Ignite my every day, because beauty is skin deep, but soul fire is an aura incomparable, indescribable, Yet I continually search for a way to explain the joys and the pain, and way it keeps me sanely insane. As I chase the soul fire round the world again, there's soul fire here and there's magic behind the way that it roars and hatred I find when I can't have my soul fire. When it's just out of reach, I have come to expect it. It has nearly impeached every shred of reality in my sick, twisted mind. So I beg for my soul fire, and I beg it to bind me into it as one, so I would never be left behind. End quote. Stacy will tell us a lot more about the aftermath of Daniel's death for her and her family in the bonus episode. So what happened to Joshua Tyler Brito, you ask? Well, on December 4th, 2013... He was additionally charged with the attempted sexual assault and the unlawful confinement of Daniel Levesque. In January 2014, a preliminary inquiry before a provincial court judge was held and Josh Brito was ordered to stand trial on all three charges. On January 28, 2015, Josh Brito's trial began before a judge and jury. The trial proceeded until March 2nd. That day, the court declared a mistrial because of the Crown's inadvertent late disclosure of forensic computer evidence. The judge who had presided over the aborted trial was keen to keep the matter on track, and within a few days of the mistrial, a new trial date was scheduled to begin on October 13, 2015, and end in December 2015. In the spring of 2015, a new judge... Justice G.R.J. Gull was assigned to preside at Josh Brito's trial. The October 2015 trial date had to be adjourned when it became clear to all that the host of pretrial applications from Daniel's counsel could not be heard and decided in the allotted time. In August 2016, the trial was rescheduled to begin on May 15, 2017, 
and conclude in the third week of June that same year. Regrettably, it again became apparent during the pretrial applications that more time was required to conclude them all and that this would not happen for the spring 2017 trial date. Consequently, the trial was adjourned to the fall and winter of 2017 and there were still pending pretrial applications to be dealt with. Josh's counsel was busy, busy, busy. In late May 2017, the Crown filed a new indictment charging Josh Brito with the manslaughter death of Daniel. In doing so, Justice G.R.J. Gall surmised that the Crown had accepted that it couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Josh Brito possessed the requisite intent to commit murder. Josh Brito was then arraigned on the indictment, and he pleaded guilty. Manslaughter, too, can result in a life sentence if the judge deems it appropriate. In this case, apparently it wasn't. The judge said, quote, Mr. Brito, as a result of your unlawful act of assaulting Daniel Levesque with a hammer and confining him in the apartment, you caused his death. In doing so, you committed the crime of manslaughter. Your counsel and Crown counsel have jointly submitted that the appropriate sentence for your offense is nine years, two months, and 19 days. Factoring in the time that you have already spent in pre-sentence custody, the Crown and your counsel submit that you should serve an additional two years less than one day in prison, followed by a three-year probation period. I accept that joint submission and sentence you accordingly. End quote. Upon his release, Joshua Tyler Brito was to be placed on a three-year probation order. The conditions of this order included maintaining good behavior and peace, complying with court appearances, promptly notifying authorities of any personal information changes, not using any aliases, and reporting to a probation office within 24 hours of release. During the initial probation officer meeting, Josh Brito was also to provide his full residential details. He would be prohibited from communicating with specific individuals involved with the case and from visiting locations associated with them. Furthermore, he was to refrain from using controlled substances unless prescribed medically and from possessing weapons. Additionally, Brito was ordered to attend and complete assessments, counseling, or programs as directed by his probation officer, which could encompass violence and drug prevention programs or forensic assessment and treatment through designated facilities. Josh Brito was released from prison early in October 2018. He'd served only 16 months. Daniel's family and friends, of course, were appalled and didn't even hear about the release until November. And I'm appalled as well. How could this guy do this and serve 16 months? Right. I mean, he was in jail uh, for a period of time when he was charged with first degree murder until his trial. But do you see this, Mike? What's this? Yeah, it's the world's tiniest violin playing, exactly. you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's about consequences. I, there weren't a lot of consequences for this guy for what he did. There weren't. Not at all. 16 months in jail. Stacy warned people in a Facebook post that we'll link to in our show notes, and she listed his many known aliases, as well as Joshua Tyler Brito. He calls himself Josh Baba, Josh Buxton, Josh Chartier, Josh Mitchell, and a few others. Stacy wrote at the end of her post, please watch your children, your sons, your hearts, Google everyone you meet, and make sure to never believe anything this killer says. Has Josh Brito changed his ways? Stacy's mom and I will discuss Brito's alleged post-prison activities in our bonus episode, and they'll make your hair stand up. So, Mike, when I was reading this and starting to do research, I started bumping into articles... Before this one? Before Daniel died, yep. And this guy's in the news for nefarious activities, and I'm like, oh, they misattributed the the the, the name of the person in the photograph because that, that's the guy that killed, killed Daniel. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, my God, it's the same. Yeah. I think everyone should log in and see the picture of this guy so they know who he is. Um, I want to slap him in the face. Um, but, yeah, make sure you... Just Google the guy. Just Google him. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 300, Lured by Lies, The Murder of Daniel Levesque, part one. Again, you'll find part two in your feed today. That's right. 
It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right. It's time for some voicemails. We're back after a long holiday, a nice long holiday. We had a bit of time off. But let's hear what uh, people had to say to us over that time. We got quite a few voicemails that we're going to have to get to at some point. But, over the uh, next few episodes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hi, Mike and Matthew. It is your local backyard bonfire ray planner from PEI. Uh, Lacey calling. Um, I had called back, I want to say it was May, um, and Matthew had guessed what I do for a job. <laughs> and from the way I was describing living rurally, never in the city, blah, 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 that's what he came up with, was the backyard bonfire brave planner. And needless to say, I was kind of at a dark moment in my life, and you guys gave a bit of light to that day. Um, it made me laugh. It made all my friends laugh. I made sure to send it like I was, um, because basically that is what I do. I plan all our parties, and ironically, I had a bonfire planned for the weekend coming up after that aired. Um, I want to say thank you so much for all the informative episodes as of recently. I just finished listening to the most recent ones, and it was a lot of, like, information I didn't know. I knew the history Chinese culture with Canada, but I didn't know it in depth detail. Like that was amazing to hear and get all that information. Matthew did amazing on those episodes. I just wanted to call in before the holidays and wish you guys a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whatever you celebrate, and wish you all the best in 2024. I can't wait to see what the new year brings for Dark Poutine and for both of you. Thanks so much for all the episodes and laugh, information, and even the tragic stories. Thanks so much. Again, it's Lacey from PEI. Bye. You know what I want Lacey to do? What? I don't know why, but as she's talking, I was sitting here thinking, I've never been to a beach clam bake. <laughs> and and if Lacey's a party planner, I wanted to plan a clam bake on the beach that I'll go to in 2024. Well, I'd love to go to a clam bake in PEI. That would be fun. Have you ever been to one? I, absolutely, I have. I'm a Nova Scotian. <laughs> I've never been to one, and I saw one on um, a TV show I'm watching right now called Revenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> clam bake doesn't go so well. Somebody pulls out a gun. Sure. That won't happen, but I want to go to clam bake, and I think Lacey's the woman to... To plan the clam bake. <laughs> plan the clam. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, Lacey, she's she's now looking up, how the hell do you do a clam bag? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, here's, Lace. Here's our next voicemail. Hello, my name is Carrie. I am a truck driver. I uh, recently uh, learned of your podcast from the Ghost Story guys. Mike, you were a, a guest on a recent episode. I'm a patron of uh the ghost story guys uh so there's potential i might uh you know i might choose to become a patron of your show i just re listened to your uh your most recent episode about uh the chinese exclusion in canada and found it immensely immensely interesting i listen to a podcast while i'm driving uh so things that uh can kind of uh, you know, help prevent the, the boredom of being on the road, things that, you know, help stave off the uh, lulling myself to sleep from driving. You know, if I can keep my uh, my mind alert and awake, then, you know, it's helpful. And uh, interesting podcasts like yours are, uh, are definitely uh, on the menu. So thank you. Thanks, Carrie. That's awesome, uh, and I'm glad that uh, we we scored one from the ghost <laughs> ghost story guys. They're great. That was a really fun episode. And if you're looking for the episode, it's called "Things to Doing Parking Lots When You're Dead." <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and you, you know what I've noticed? We actually have. Um, uh, I want to say high percentage. A lot of people who are truckers mm -hmm. uh, listen to us, and and yep. I'm gl I'm glad that we help you guys not get that white line fever. 
Right. I, I mean, I know when I drove across the country, I had to listen to things to keep me sort of awake. And I was uh, in the midst of having uh, some very serious sleep apnea at the time. So I was really tired all the time. I've shared a hotel room with you with your whole device attached to your head. Mike, yeah. looks, like he, Mike looks like he's in like a, a sci-fi when he goes to sleep. Yeah, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm essentially a Top Gun pilot when I go to bed. <laughs> it's like it's such a contraption. I enter the danger zone, as it were, <laughs> and I'm like, oh god, how am I going to sleep? <laughs> you know, but you know, whatever. It's it's quiet. The thing's a, qu- a lot quieter than probably the old fashioned ones used right. to be. Yeah, yeah, and at least it's not an iron lung. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to another voicemail. Hi, Mike and Matthew. Um, it's your favorite fan from the southwest of Nova Scotia. Um, I just finished listening to part two of the Chinese exclusion episode, The Hid Tax. And my goodness, I choked up quite a few times during these two episodes, particularly when you told the stories about the families that didn't reunite for 30 years and the other guy that, anyways, it, it is, it's a dark stain on our history, but we need to remember it. And I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm so thankful for you guys for shedding light on these stories of our history. It's needed so much so today. It's actually so relevant today. And, you know, there's still racism that persists in different areas of our society. And we, people have got to get a life and have got to get with the 21st century i just i knew about the hit tax previously i just didn't know how deep it went into our history and you know matthew you did a really good job writing this episode and um lots of compassion in there and details and thank you for that um my goodness what an episode and i have a lot of chinese friends too and i'm just thinking like I just cannot believe that this happened. Like, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Um, anyways, great episode, guys. Um, <laughs> I, I cry quite a bit. Um, you guys do a really good job. Um, please keep doing what you're doing. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. There you go. Uh, Matthew, you're getting a lot of kudos for your, your rear writing. Um, I'm so glad because you were so, you had, Matthew has a confidence problem around his writing and, and I don't think you should, you know? And I I also, you also, you also watch my, um, uh, Matthewism. Well, that, no, that was supposed to be one episode and you, you watch the, the angst I go through doing this because I get, Mm -hmm. and thank you, thank you for that caller to, to, who call it the compassion because, when I get into these things, Mikey, I've explained this to you. I, yeah. I want to do a good job. Me and too. I have, and, and like the caller, I have Chinese friends. I want to do a God, good job for them. I want to do a good job for, you know, for the community. Again, because you get this like burden of responsibility when you're telling these stories, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. I'm actually, I'm going, I'm slipping off to Chinatown to get some pastries this afternoon. <laughs> well, it's almost, it's almost uh, the Lunar New Year. Lunar New Year. Yeah. So yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to maybe a moon cake or two. Yeah, I'm working. Uh, I'm working on a on another dark Canadian history episode. Uh, so am I. Excellent, Smithers. Yep. Excellent. I'm working on a few actually. <laughs> I've all, there's only been 300 episodes so far. So you know, people say, "How do you come up with all this stuff?" Guess what? History is full of craziness. It, it's it's easy to find. It's, you know what? It's kind of sad. Like I kind of wish we could just shut down this show because nobody's murdering anybody. Nobody's racist anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah, would it be? Would it be being nice to I would, each other? I would be willing to give up the show if the planet started being nice to each other. Well, <laughs> when the aliens but, come and and tell us that we're just essentially vessels for you know their soul drinking uh then, <laughs> then all we're we're gonna have to come together at that at that point oh mike save it for paranormal I'm, circumstances i'm supernatural circumstances <laughs> sorry Matthew. supernatural anyway circumstances. i'm kidding but uh yeah <laughs> sorry i called it paranormal <laughs> circumstances let's move on 
It's not e even alliterative. Hi, uh, Mike and Matthew. This is Michaela from Chilliwack, British Columbia. I am walking along the Vetter River, and it's Christmas Eve, so Merry Christmas. Um, I have my five-month-old daughter with me in the stroller, so you might hear a bit of gravel under the wheels. Anyhow, I just wanted to say that I listened to your podcast on the history of Chinese immigration to British Columbia, and I appreciated it so, so much. Um, I myself am Caucasian, but my husband is Chinese, a Chinese immigrant um, from Shanghai. He came here with his family in 2005, and so my daughter is half and half. And I think being married to someone who is a Chinese immigrant has really opened my eyes to the racism in this province. And yeah, it's been really saddening to me. And even just having my daughter for the past five months, I've, I've heard a lot of not so nice comments and some very ignorant comments. And um, anyways, I'm just so appreciative of people talking about the history of Chinese immigration and um, yeah, just talking about how, you know, they were here first before before the white people came. And, and um, yeah, just thanks for shedding some truth and some light and making me tear up a little bit as I was thinking about my own family. So, yeah, great. I hope you guys are having a Merry Christmas. And, uh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you two you know what in your hat, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, have a Merry Christmas. Michaela didn't want to say the word shit in front of her daughter so that was kind of cute go go shit in your christmas stocking right. um michaela steve is from chilliwack as well right he is yeah yeah steve some um, steve uh came from a, a breed originally i found out in chilliwack so he's from the whack he's from the whack steve's a good egg i love steve i you know he's laying uh, fast asleep behind me snoring right now oh that's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. So I'm looking forward to Patreon and our Donut Money donors again, because on Christmas Eve... Carolyn Terpstra from O'Fallon, Missouri, uh, came to us as a new patron. So thank you, Carolyn. What does Carolyn do there in Missouri, Matthew? I think, so O'Fallon is, um, has like 91,000 people. So it's a decent, decent size little city. Yeah, that's a good size city. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, I think she is, trying to figure out she's designing uh, a new flag for O'Fallon. Well, there you go. That's yeah, nice. Because I don't I don't like the current one. Okay, <laughs> so what new, was she, it, what's she putting on new, the new flag? <laughs> I don't know, but not that building. No, okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so there's a building on their flag. <laughs> no, the flag was I like I I work in communications in, in, yeah. on the side uh, other than dark poutine and it's just it's just mediocre design. I think I think she could do a much better <laughs> <Dear>. job. Uh <laughs> Dark Poutine does not endorse Matthew Stockton's no, opinion. No, I'm sure the like the the St. Mary's Institute and the Fort Zumwalt Park, lovely and probably salt of the earth people, but I don't like the flag. Okay, well, fair enough. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, Carolyn. All right, so uh, next up we have... Candace Puff, and she's from Wayne, New Jersey, and I don't want to out her with her real last name because people use usernames for a reason. Uh, so, Candace Puff, what does Candace Puff do there in Wayne, Matthew? So, Candace is the heiress to the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Corporation. Okay. And she, uh, she was the one that got the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man in in the movie Ghostbusters that uh, reinvigorated her family company. Well, there you go. I'm I'm yeah. all about the marshmallows. I love me a marshmallow. Did you roast you... marshmallows as a kid over a campfire? 
so I liked to burn them and then mm-hmm. take that take that burnt skin off and then eat it and then burn it again and take the skin off and eat it. That's how I did my marshmallows. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. I just burned it and then ate the whole thing because I'm a pig. I'm, sh- I'm, so. I'm sure it was carcinogenic, but what can you do? Yeah, what the heck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you only live once. You might as well uh, destroy yourself while you're at it. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Candace, for uh, bringing marshmallows to the world. Stay puffed, Candace. Stay puffed. Stay puffed, Candace. Next, we have Nadia Perzan. And Nadia says, for Christmas donuts, Nadia from Thornhill Woods. Where's Thornhill Woods, Matthew? That sounds interesting. I would bet that is somewhere in Ontario. How about you? How about you? Are you thinking that? Well, no, because there's a Thornhill in Ontario, but not Thornhill Woods that I know of. Well, there's Thornhill Woods uh, Public School in uh, Thornhill Woods Drive, Ontario. There's lots of Thornhill Woods Haunted House. Maybe she's from Vaughan. There is Thornhill Woods. No, there's, yeah, Thornhill Woods in Vaughan. It's a spectacular infill housing community built by Treasure Hill Homes. There you go. Exactly. So there is a Thornhill Woods. Mm. Yeah. So you were right. It is in Vaughn. There you go. Um, What's Vaughn like? I've never been. I don't think. Yeah. So I have been to Vaughn. I haven't been to (laughs) Vaughn, but I've been to Canada's Wonderland. I loved Canada's Wonderland when I was a kid. Mind you, uh, mind you, um, Cedar Point, Ohio, I preferred because they they had this thing called the Gemini where you'd actually race another roller coaster. Oh, God. So yeah. you like rides. I did when I was young. Now that I'm older and I've seen horror stories um, and also uh, that movie series that I love. Um, uh, what's that movie series called? Final Destination. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love it. They so made that bad. here. Yeah, they it's made that here. So bad, but I love Final Destination. So, yeah. so be- because of Final Destination, I no longer go on roller coasters. No, oh, there you go. Uh, because of having um, a a body, I don't go on roller coasters or anything <laughs> where my body <laughs> is flung about. I was. I've never been good at it. We went on the Flume ride. I think it was in Bush Gardens in okay. Florida when I was a kid. And I screamed so much, I wanted to get off at the top of the, <laughs> at the top of the the peak, and I would like my mom would just had no idea what, what to do. I feel so terrible. I was so afraid. I was one of those kids that like put my arms in the air and like no, la- no. La- la- laughed the entire time. Yeah, I was afraid to like go on a bicycle. So. <laughs> I did. I didn't. I wouldn't have guessed that about you. Oh, I was terrified of everything when I was a kid. Everything, oh. everything. Like, oh, I have to stand up. I'm afraid. Were you fr- <laughs> Were you afraid of ducks? Uh, no, but I was afraid of dogs. I was afraid okay. of dogs when I was a little kid because oh. I had a, 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 I had a Dalmatian jump up on me. He was being friendly, you know. Like, yeah. I, but but he jumped up on me and knocked me down, and I was terrified of dogs after that. And then as I grew up, I realized Dalma- or Dalmatians aren't that big. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, how did it knock me over? I, I guess just, I was a little, little kid. just seemed big because it was probably taller than you at the time. Yeah, it was like this monstrous thing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, 101 Dalmatians traumatized me. It, <laughs> it did. It totally did. I hated that movie. <laughs> uh. Anyway, I've grown up and now I love all dogs. And Dalmatians are very cute. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. So that is it for our 300th episode, Matthew. Thank you for joining me once again. 
And uh, for everybody else, until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. It's a new year, so let's let's all try to be good eggs. Yeah. Yeah.